Good morning and welcome for all of us for whom it is morning. If it's another time of day, welcome to you also. It's my pleasure to invite and welcome Dr. Dave DeSteno to join me in a live Q&A for our Science of Happiness community, for our Greater Good Science Center community, and anyone else who has been lucky enough to hear about this and has the time to join us uh, in this discussion today. Uh, Dave DeSteno is one of my all-time favorite researchers in the space of happiness and prosociality, has done work that I love talking about because it's so clever and provocative and important and informing. So Dave, I wanna invite you to introduce yourself to our audience, to our community, really let us know kind of what inspired you. How did you get to be one of these pioneering experts in the space of, of human well-being and, and, and how important kindness is and connections, social connections are to our well-being? Sure. Well, first, thanks to Miliana and everybody else who's making time um, today to listen to this. And I'm, I'm honored to be able to share my ideas and work with you. Um, how did I get interested in it? Um, I, so my graduate school advisor, I was always interested in, in what emotions do for people. Um, my graduate school advisor was Peter Salovey. Some of you may know is kind of one of the co-discoverers of emotional intelligence. And um, for me, the idea about how our emotions shape what we think, what we see, how we want to interact with others has always been really interesting. But over time, you know, when I, I began, I studied kind of basic emotions, things like fear and anger. But over time, through my own interests and the interests of my students, we were focusing on this, what I think historically was an understudy, understudied class of emotions, which are these kind of positive pro-social emotions. And what I mean by social emotions are emotions that exist only in the context of interpersonal interaction, and that's where a lot of well-being and happiness comes from. Um, so things like gratitude and compassion and pride and these types of positive rewarding experiences, what do they do for us? And to make a long story short, because I'm sure you'll hear about it as we, as we go through this, this Q&A, is um, what we think a lot of these emotions do is they, is they underlie social living. They kind of grease the wheels of social living. They, they help us form relationships, maintain relationships which are important for our success and the success of others. And I say the one thing that my lab, after that nice introduction by Emiliana, is, is known for is um, putting people in real-time situations where these things happen. And so when we study these emotions, we don't say, what do you think you might do if you feel grateful? We'll actually construct a whole ruse with actors where something befalls you and, and you somebody helps you and you feel grateful and then you have to actually exert some cost or energy to help them and we see if you will. And so for us, one of the hallmarks of what we do is kind of studying real social behavior in real time and manipulating emotions in real time. Yeah, that's so great and it's so important. And actually it's a great a segue into one of the first questions that we got from a student in our Science of Happiness course. Um, this student was just wondering, um, how, how much can we count on self-report data about happiness? Um, a lot of the research that has been done that um, describes the factors or characteristics or perhaps even genetic uh, endowments that are associated with happiness rely on this measure of how happy are you? Um, even a measure of how are you feeling right now that is a, a more time constrained affect measure as opposed to an overarching how happy is your life kind of measure. Uh, what do you think about self-report and as, as somebody who also studies emotions yeah. are part of, of, of people's overall happiness? Is that something you rely on or, or is do. it does it have to do. be the, the setup that you guys do? No, I mean, I, I think self-report is really useful when you study emotions because, I mean, as we know more and more, there, there aren't always clear physiological signatures or even brain fMRI signatures for, for certain states. We can tell if you're kind of feeling positive or negative. Beyond that, we can't tell that much with those types of measures that often. And so unless it's a situation where people feel a, 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 tendon, feel a, a pressure to lie, so sometimes someone says, how are you today? And yeah. you're feeling like crud, but you don't want to say, I feel like crud. But you know, in most instances, it, it, it's anonymous data. And I, I, I think people, unless they have a motivation to lie to you, are, are gonna tell you and they're gonna have insight into it. And so I think most of those emotions, self-reports are good as long as they're targeted to specific times. I think it's difficult when you say, how happy were you in general or last year? Mm -hmm. Those are difficult. For me, where self-report falls is when we say, well, predict what that emotion is gonna make you do. Yeah. And I think there, you know, work by Dan Gilbert and Tim Wilson and other folks have shown that we're not always good at predicting how we'll feel in response to something and what we'll do. And I think it's not because we'll 
we're going to lie, but yeah. it's because we don't really know yeah. right? until, until push comes. We think we're going to be fair and honest and kind. Um, and when push comes to shove, we, we may not be. And so that's why in our lab, a lot of the behaviors, we, a lot of the measures we do are behaviors in terms of, you know, but people acting pro-socially or anti-socially. But in terms of how they're feeling, we do rely on asking them in the moment, how do you feel right now? I think that's okay. Yeah, yeah, that's my that's my impression also. I do have one kind of follow-up um, issue to bring up, which is what what role, and, and I'd be curious in your work, whether you have any insights from your from your research, what role do you feel culture plays in the kinds of patterns of self-report different people might actually uh, endorse? So, for example, um, I often talk about the World Happiness Report and different mm -hmm. nations score in different ways, and often places like Denmark and Sweden score really close to the top, Australia, New Zealand, and other countries score you know, lower down. And then you hear a story of a place like Bhutan, which has very deliberately created the Gross National Happiness Project and has really pri prioritized at a high policy level this idea mm -hmm. that well-being of their citizens is, is front and center to, to their interests as a country, yet they don't score at the top of a, of a, of a Cantrell ladder, you know, how satisfied are you with your life kind of index, which is typical to the World Happiness Report. Do you think that things like humility or a more collectivist cultural orientation actually influence how people respond to self-report queries about emotion or, or overall life qualities? Yeah, it's a good question. And let me let me press it by saying I don't do cross cultural work, but from what we know about how people report their feeling states, and from what I know about that work, there are certain norms in what emotions are valued and what emotions are okay to express, mm -hmm. uh, you know, or admirable or are kind of embarrassing to have. I mean, some cultures you don't you don't want to tout what you have that's good because people feel like you're 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 bringing the potential of of of, of bad luck on yourself from doing it, and so there is certainly going to be cultural variation. And I think to the extent that we can begin to map that, that might help to make sense of some things. I think if you ask most people, how satisfied are you with your life right now? Maybe there you won't see it quite as much, but in general, you know, to endorse certain states, I think you will find cultural differences. And, and I think, Emilia, you're right. I, I don't think we have that mapped out and kind of doing cross-cultural analyses and corrections. Yeah, well, it'll be fun when that comes up and when that becomes part of your legacy of science. I hope somebody yeah. joins your lab and, and has, the, uh, has the interest and the expertise to go there. Um, the reason I bring it up, other than my own curiosity and questions from students, is that our audience right now is, um, it is comprised of people from all over the world for the science of happiness as well as the Greater Good Science Center. We, we know, for example, that only 30% of our students each time we run the class are from the U.S. And so we, we really do um, teach a science that to some degree is somewhat limited and young. And one of the qualities of being a young science is this, this, this observation that many of the studies are run on, on people from the U.S. And, and, and that might represent something that, that at least there's a lot of opportunity for growth. Um, that was actually a question that came in across uh, from, from one of our students, which was, "What? How? You know, how, how much can we really rely on the kind of research that that we've done that our colleagues like Sonia Lubomirsky and Barbara Fredrickson have done in this space?" given that it's, that it's relatively young and that, as you and I both know, science is this sort of constantly evolving field where what was known to be true one day, you know, 15 years later is just yeah. completely debunked. I think you actually write about some of this in your, in your forthcoming book called mm -hmm. Emotional Success. You know, how, how much can we really, you know, sort of sink our teeth into this, this science of happiness that we're, that we're in the middle of? Well, as you say, the science of happiness is a, is a fairly young kind of investigative arena. Um, but it's also an area that is not unknown territory. I mean, you know, you've had centuries of, of philosophers or wisdom traditions or, you know, advice from grandmothers telling us about what, what matters and what makes us happy. And so in, in that sense, I, I don't think we're, we're skating in an area where we don't know what's, what's coming. Um, and I think a lot of the work that's being done is is good work. Um, are there is there going to be cultural bounds and variations to it? Yes. Are we going to find some certain claims that are going to be wrong? Yes. But I think in general, even in its early stages, the science of happiness has been very cumulative. That is, 
we have yet to find something that makes us say, forget it, everything we know is wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank goodness. Um, well, on that note, uh, just drilling down into one of the ideas or, or concepts that, that comes up in discussions about happiness in different cultures is the idea of luck. So um, you and I both grew up in a time where at some point in our education, we were told that some of our experience and, and lived um, moments was a result of our upbringing, our experience, our childhoods, and uh, uh, in, in contrast, other aspects of who we are and how we feel was purely a function of our genes and uh, our biological endowment. And now there's a, there's a, night, a space where lots of, of turnover has occurred, and we, we know deeply that, in fact, there's a much more nuanced interaction between a, a genetic affordance and a lived experience that begins well before a person actually uh, arrives as a physical body in the world. So um, what, where I'm getting to is, is how much of, of our happiness is about aspects of our life that feel beyond our, our impact, our control, our purchase? How much of it is luck? And how important is it to really sort of notice or appreciate or perhaps be grateful for the luck that we felt in life? Is that, does that feel like something that's important to well-being and even perhaps our, our, our success in the world? A colleague of mine, Bob Frank, who's an economist at Cornell, had this great book come out last year called Success and Luck, where he deals with this issue. Um, and I think, as you're saying, but, you know, a lot of us are, are where we are in a good position in life. We're in a poor one based not on our own outcomes or our genetic endowments, but on, on what happened to us. And I think a lot of it has to do with how well we adapt to it has to do with how we appraise it in the way you're saying. And so a lot of people are hesitant to say my success is because of some external force. They want to feel it's only them, mm -hmm. which also which, which causes two problems. One is that it, when something bad happens, that means it's only them. And that can mm -hmm. be very debilitating. But it also separates them from other important probably people in their lives. Right? If we feel grateful for our station in life, for what's happened to us, for the benefits we've been given, what that feeling of gratitude does while we feel it is make us likely to help others, to build relationships with others, to, to reinforce those social relationships, and to feel valued ourselves, whether it's grateful to God or to faith or to other people who've helped us along the way. Those emotions bind us to others. And I think that, that gives us a more resilient kind of route to success. And I think it doesn't take away from us. It embeds us in a, in a social community. And I think work by Tom Gilovich um, has actually shown that, you know, feeling luck a grateful for the luck that you're given actually improves people's well-being and outlook on life in general, even though you would think it makes you feel powerless. Um, I actually think it makes you feel more powerful because I argue is, I don't know what that noise is. <laughs> yeah, sorry, it's in this room. I don't know what it is either, but um, my delightful uh, uh, colleague in here is, is trying to sort it out and, yeah. and make it stop. But, uh, this is so fabulous that we're talking all about luck and yet these Technology, our, our technology luck is not on our side this morning. <laughs> one important thing I want to say before we move on that is, is one thing when we talk about gratitude, what gratitude does, whether it's gratitude for someone helping you or gratitude for luck, is gratitude is really about the future, not about the past. Most people think about it as I'm grateful for what happened in the past. But mm -hmm. when you feel grateful, what it really does is it reinforces you going forward to work harder, to be more kind, to be more generous, and to build those relationships that will help you keep building your success. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's it's, it's really interesting. I think Bob Emmons also talks at length about how gratitude, in some regards, is kind of an antidote to entitlement. And yeah. entitlement is almost a consequence of, of, of not acknowledging the role of luck in your success, right? As you... It's true. And, and you know, work by, by, you know, your colleagues, Emiliana, like Dr. Keltner and Paul Pitt yeah. and others have shown that, you know, when we, when we feel we have an overinflated sense of power, what that can do is make us less compassionate and less ethical. Whereas if we appreciate the role of luck in us getting to our position, I, I think we're less likely to interpret it as it's us and our power and status is so high. Exactly, exactly. Um, uh, when, when, when we think about luck, and you brought up the idea of religion as sometimes being a, an aspect of life that maybe focuses people to think about their luck in a more, in a more grateful way or to acknowledge um, a higher power in being behind or being causal to their position in life that, that might be uh, something that is um, desirable or mm -hmm. 
or, or pleasurable. Um, do you think that religions or kind of certain spiritual orientations or traditions sometimes get in the way of a common humanistic view of, of luck in the sense that if I'm lucky, it's because I'm kind of uh, con committed to my religion in a particular way, whereas someone who's less lucky is, is there because they haven't been as committed to their religion. Do you think sometimes ideologies, not just religion, but any sort of philosophical outlook on yeah. can, can kind of get in the way? And again, I'm sorry about the noise. Um, okay. they're, they're running around next to me trying to figure out where it's coming from and how to stop it. That's okay. Um, no, I think I think it's a good point. I th and I would say ideology in general, not just a religious one, um, but yeah. I think religion is a type of ideology. Um, if you view things as kind of preordained, uh, or if people are lucky because they're good people, then that can then that can be a problem. I mean, it, it kind of in some ways reflects back on some of the work that you may have talked about. You know, you know, Carol Dweck's mindset work, right? That is, are 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 things fixed or are things changeable? Um, I think if you view that. The ideology, whether it's just world ideology or strict kind of conservatism that, you know, your station in life is only due to you. Um, for the same reasons I said before, that can be problematic if you feel good in some ways. But when things go wrong, that makes you doubt yourself. But it's also an isolating kind of ideology and one where you view other people who aren't doing as well as well. They're less deserving, which is going to inhibit your wanting to reach out to them to have compassion for them. And I think that that weaken social bonds instead of strengthening them. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, Dave, I had a request to put your mic a little yep. closer. Some yep. might want to hear you a little louder, especially okay. so you have this um, competing sound that sure. maybe is keeping everyone on the edge of their seats. Oh, yay! Okay. <laughs> Alarm has, has ceased, and um, hopefully uh, we'll, we'll commence with our conversation without, without that behind us. Um, okay. Apologize to everyone on for that noise. Um, who knows what it was, but it's done. So we've solved it and we'll move on. Um, I'm going to sort of switch gears a little bit and ask a question that's sort of related to what we've been talking about, factors that play a role in how we think about ourselves and how we think about other people and ultimately that contribute to our sense of, of well-being or happiness in the world. Um, one of the ideas that is central to your work and to what we teach in the course is that social connections are mm -hmm. so important and um, predictive of people's overall happiness in life. And mm -hmm. even, you know, looking to the work of, of our colleague and friend Matt Killingsworth, it is really important to our momentary sense of well-being and happiness, uh, no matter what we're doing. So one student wanted to know is, is this correlational? Are, are people who just have good social connections happier or um, do happy people, are they just better at making good social connections? So do we have, and, and, and I'm, I'm hoping you'll have some, some, some great uh, study yeah. that, that, that speaks to this question of, yeah. can we say that there's a causal, there's, there's a causal relationship here, not just correlational relationship? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good question. When you measure it in the real world, it's, it's difficult to separate those two for the reasons I think the person is, is, is noticing. So yeah, I think in, in our lab, um, we have data to suggest there actually is a causal relationship. So I can tell you briefly about some of those. And so when we um, uh, induce emotions like gratitude or compassion in our, in our people, and we do it in all kinds of ways. So I won't go into that. But when we do that, what we see is they engage in behaviors that are likely to build strong social relationships. So what does that mean? It means they'll behave in more trustworthy ways. They'll share profits with others equally rather than take them for themselves. They'll offer to help other people if they need it. They'll go out of their way to assist somebody if they think they're in some discomfort or pain. And they'll even um, accept costs, monetary costs to, to, to be loyal to their uh, partners when they're feeling grateful. And even to, even to people they've never met before. So sometimes we'll make you feel grateful and introduce you to a stranger and you'll show the same type of social behavior. And I think, Emiliana, you'd agree that if you, know, you come across someone who's, who's honest and kind and wants to be loyal to you and do those things, and that's somebody you would like to build a relationship with. And so um, we haven't charted over, over long periods of time, but over short periods of time, feeling these emotions changes social behaviors in ways that make you um, uh, a more attractive uh, mm -hmm. partner. And mm -hmm. from what we can tell work uh, by Sarah Aljo and others that it actually does build relationships over time. Yeah, yeah, well, I love that. And, and sometimes I get asked to speak about sort of adolescence and the importance of sort of social hierarchies and what mm -hmm. kinds of behaviors really feed into that. Is it the kind of top of the, top of the chain, tough guy, 
gal orientation characteristic personality mm -hmm. or is it the, the the teens who have figured out how to really read other people's emotions and relate yeah. to other people in a constructive way yeah. what i see is that it's it's the empathic teens who end up in the positions of of greater sort of social rapport as opposed to the kind of historic strange cultural notion that that bullies end up at the top of the of the hierarchy well you're right and I, let me give you another angle on that so um, when people ask me, is it better to basically be a jerk or to be empathic and be nice to be successful? I say, well, what's your time frame? <laughs> so in the short term, right? In the short term, if you're, if you're a jerk, if you cheat people, if you act in immoral ways, you can accrue lots of resources quickly. But this is great work by uh, Martin Novak at Harvard and Dave Rand and other folks. They show that over time, individuals who are willing to share, who accept some sacrifice in the moment to, to be communal with others, mm -hmm. over time, the aggregated gains they make benefit them and their partners more than, than kind of being, uh, uh, you know, selfish on your own. And so mm -hmm. as long as you're taking a long-term view, it, clearly you're right. It's those who are empathic, those who are fair, those who are grateful have the better outcome. Yeah, 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 yeah. great. Um, okay, so sometimes, and this is an experience that probably most people have, we have the aspiration, wake up in the morning, we're, we're, we're committed to this path, we're imagining how to channel our gratitude, our compassion, uh, sort of orienting our, our, our day towards activities that might contribute to our sense of pride. But mm -hmm. for one reason or another, we're, we're in a bad mood. We feel grouchy. Yeah. We feel irritated. We maybe feel kind of diffident about what's ever possible for me. Um, and, and one student wanted to know, like, how do you, how do you manage? And this is going to be to your emotion scientist uh, self. Like, yeah. how do we manage bad moods? How do we relate to those in a way that is constructive and, and might sort of lend itself to, to, to furthering our happiness? Yeah, um, there are lots of techniques. Um, I, you know, one of my favorite for, for emotions like gratitude is to take time every day to kind of do a gratitude diary or count your blessings. The important thing there, though, is we all have the three or four things in our life that we're incredibly grateful for. And if you think about those every day, you're going to habituate to them and they're going to lose their power. Mm -hmm. so what I recommend and what we're doing in our research is asking people, just think about today. A, yeah. gentle, a, a simple kindness, did somebody hold the door for you? Did somebody stop and you know, give you directions when you were lost? Did somebody let you in on the freeway? Um, little things like this can dramatically change how we, how, we, how we think about what emotional state we're in. That's one. Practicing mindfulness is also another. We've got lots of work showing that meditative practice increases feelings of compassion and gratitude, kind of automatically just cultivates those. Um, feelings of... of of pride, and I mean a good sense of pride, you're actually proud in the work you're doing, is, is to basically, one, treat yourself with self-compassion for your failures, but also celebrate the little steps along the way. That is, you know, I might want to write the world's greatest novel. That's mm -hmm. going to take me years. And if, if I'm punching myself each step along the way, I'm never going to get there. But if I celebrate the little, the little baby steps along the way, those are important things as well. And I think the main thing to think about is that we have some control over our emotions. Right? Our emotions are our mind's responses to what we see in front of us. And we have the ability to select certain situations. Selecting social contact is an important one as well to regulate your moods. But if we can make ourselves, we can choose what we think about and how we interpret things, and then the emotions will follow. I think we have to view emotions as things that we have control over as opposed to things that just happen to us. Yeah, yeah, I love that. And I would add to it, uh, one thing that I find really helpful in those moments is to really remember that my scope of, of awareness, of, of, of conscious attention is limited. And I can be sort of overly consumed by the thoughts and the ruminations and the reflections and the ideas that are contributing to that bad mood. Um, say I got a parking citation and I, mm -hmm. I can go on and on about how unfair it is and how frustrated I am and how ugly the, the system that makes that happen to me is, or knowing that, 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 that I, I don't have to actually try to like find something else to, to, to overcome that. But instead, mm -hmm. if I, again, think about an alternative aspect of my life that is, um, mm -hmm. that is uplifting and, and generous, it, it, it actually occupies my consciousness in a way that maybe can, can, can sort of 
move that negative thinking out of the center of my consciousness and mm -hmm. get me out of this reflective process that's very internal and instead into a space where I'm noticing exactly what's happening around me in that moment in that day. And I love that you brought up really right now, what's happening right now in this day that you can be grateful for, mm -hmm. rather than trying to set the expectation that every single day, my gratitude for my spouse is going to be the thing that keeps me going. Um, that's not to say that I'm not grateful to my spouse. I that's absolutely it. am. And, <laughs> um, and, and that lasts, but um, uh, it's very valuable to kind of mm -hmm. be more flexible and adaptive and agile about noticing the things in this moment that are, that are particularly contributing to your sense of gratitude. Um, so on this topic of gratitude, someone wanted to know practically uh, in, in the Science of Happiness course and on the website that the Greater Good Science Center created called Greater Good in Action, we have a lot of different exercises that are drawn from research studies that have shown that if a person does this particular thing, um, they'll feel a different way after having done them and, and maybe it's a, a close proximal change or maybe it's a long-term change mm -hmm. but um we suggest two different things a, a three good things exercise which i'm sure you're familiar with when you wake up sort of or at some point in the day to keep a journal where you're noticing something positive or that that feels mm -hmm. good to you that's happening versus keep a gratitude journal, right? And, and, and there is some overlap in this sure. space empirically, but are there, is there something unique about the kind of optimism aspect of three good things versus the appreciation gratitude aspect of a gratitude journal in terms of how it contributes to well-being? Yeah, so, so I, haven't, I haven't used the three good things, but we have done lots of things on kind of things that make people feel positive and happy as opposed to specifically appreciative. And the one thing I'll tell you, and, and this is, Emilia, you were kind enough to mention, to mention my book, um, this is kind of the argument we're making that what these emotions do, things like gratitude, things like compassion, pride, they, they focus you on the future. And so what we know when people feel these emotions is they value the future more than they would have. I mean, everybody probably knows Walter Michelle's marshmallow test, right? So yeah, people who, actually, who, who, who couldn't wait, the kids who couldn't wait for the second marshmallow um, you know, had poor outcomes and self-control and all kinds of things down the line. And so we run these tests with money instead of marshmallows. And what we find is when people feel grateful, they're actually more patient. Mm -hmm. They value the future more, discount it less. Um, and what that means in general is they're willing to engage in behaviors that are uh, important for their social success and important for their own individual success. They have more patience. They're willing to behave and in, in, to be honest, to sacrifice, to help others. Why? Because those behaviors are actually... Um, bring you benefits down the line in terms of people being willing to help you back. And so these emotions, whether it's gratitude, compassion, or pride, what they do is they increase how much you value the future. They make you willing to persevere toward your goals. They make you willing to help others, whether those others are other people or your own future self. And we don't find that with just feelings of happiness, right? People are feeling just happy. It's a very pleasant feeling, but yeah. what you want to do is you want to preserve that feeling at all costs. And so you're less likely to want to engage in a sacrifice to help somebody move their couch or to help them out of a problem they're having. So I think there is a difference um, with gratitude and, and, and compassion. And, and I would bet you would find a difference in those, in those different types of journaling. Um, so I'm going to ask you to get a little deeper on that. And also, again, yeah. move your mic a little closer to your mouth. Well, sure, we've got this thing here. Yeah. Is that better yeah. if I hold it like that? Maybe, maybe that, that, that'll be, make you more audible. I want to make sure our audience gets to really hear all the insight okay. and wisdom that you're imparting. Um, so just backing up a little bit, uh, you talked about self-control, self-regulation, uh, some other ideas that come up in that space that have been popular in our, in our culture and, and conversations is grit. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there, I think it's fair to say, has been a, a huge emphasis on self-regulation as a strategy for being a more logical, rational decision maker in the world. And I think you and I are, are part of a, a, a community who has been trying to make the case that emotions, rather than being these kind of ridiculous, uncontrolled forces that drive us towards behaviors that are destructive, are actually incredibly useful. And, and, and it, it, the, 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 their promise in improving our quality of life is remarkable um, as lo if we actually bring them up to the sort of realm of importance that things like self 
self-regulation or self-control or mm -hmm. executive functioning have, have been kind of given in, in the cultural conversations around well-being and decision-making. So can you say a little more about why gratitude and compassion sure. and pride have to be as as high in the in the echelon of of of, of weight in a decision making process as something like your capacity to self regulate. Sure, I can. And, and if you can't hear me, wave at me, and I'll I'll pull my plug here. Maybe my computer mic will be better if you want. But um, just let me know. So yeah. So my argument on on why you know is grit important? Is the ability to delay gratification important? Yeah. But where did it come from, right? You know, self-control didn't evolve so that we could get good scores on standardized tests or save for retirement or lose weight. For most of our evolutionary history, none of that really mattered. Mm -hmm. What mattered was that we could behave in ways that were not selfish, that we would help other people, that we would share, that we'd be generous. And all those take self-control too, because what you're doing is taking a smaller share of whatever the resource is to admit to share with others equally rather than gobbling it up yourself. And what are the emotions that really generated that or underlie that? It was feelings like gratitude and compassion and pride. And so um, for us, um, when we, we've done a lot of work showing people feel these emotions, they will persevere longer on tasks, they'll work harder, they'll be more patient, they'll value the future more. And so I argue that it's a way to self-control from the bottom up, right? Relying on these emotional components that have solved these problems for millennia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they also have one other benefit. That is they, while you're feeling grateful, yes, you're going to pursue your own goals and be more patient, but it also makes you act in pro-social ways that bind you to others. And so unlike kind of nose to the grindstone grit, where you can basically kind of remove yourself from a lot of social interaction, these emotions ensure that you have those. Mm -hmm. And what those do is they build they build a safety net. So one of the really interesting things about grit, which is highly correlated with conscientiousness, is those people do fail less because they work hard. But mm -hmm. when they fail, the hit to their well-being is 120% more than the rest of us. And I think it's because they have all of their eggs in that one basket and they haven't mm -hmm. cultivated those social relationships to catch them when they fall. And so I think using these emotions as a route to success, you know, it, it, lets you work on, to, to paraphrase David Brooks, it lets you work on both your, your resume virtues, those are the ones that you need to get a job and get ahead, but also your eulogy ones, the ones that you wanna be remembered for. And mm -hmm. I think when we use these emotions to build success, we're working on both of those as opposed to only yeah, the, the career-oriented ones. I love that. Thank you. Um, one person actually sent us a question in real time and they wanted to know, do your experimental subjects ever figure out what you're yeah. trying to do? So you said yeah. you elicit gratitude in the lab. Does anybody ever feel like, wait a minute, I know this isn't real. You're manipulating me. And yeah. if and what do you do in those cases? And uh, how, how do they tend to behave differently than sure. the people who just kind of go with the whole paradigm and, 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 and actually have the experiences in an authentic way? So that happens about five to 10% of the time. I'll give you one example. One thing we do to evoke gratitude is we have people doing this task on the computer that's designed to be terribly awful and boring and onerous. And uh, the computer breaks and uh, then somebody else comes over and says, oh, I'm pretty good with computers. Let me see if I can help you with that. Mm -hmm. So about 5% of the time, the person gets suspicious and, and realizes something weird is going on. And when that happens, we, you know, we, we basically end the study uh, because they're not going to feel grateful. Or what happens is sometimes they do something with the computer and fix it themselves be, by, you know, before we can get there and pretend we're going to fix it. And so whenever we're doing these real-time induction, stuff like that can happen. But we work really hard to make sure that for most people, most times it seems pretty normal. Um, but yeah. when it does happen, those people are removed from the study because the illusion is gone and so is the yeah. emotion. It's a whole it's a whole different experience and yeah. you can't include it in the, in the overall uh, study or the averages or the uh, statistics that you're running. Right. Um, there's a couple of questions that came in about focus. So and distraction and uh, having it's a little bit related to what we've been talking about in the executive function, self-control, mm -hmm. mind, mindfulness realm. One of the cases that that is or one of the ideas that seems to be compelling a lot of popular discourse among scientists and thinkers and philosophers is, is what's mindfulness really doing? And is it, is it, is it overly focused on the kind of executive yeah. dimension uh, or are we really infusing it with the, the kind of compassionate or grateful or humanistic qualities that I think the traditions from which mindfulness is drawn, are we doing that effectively? Um, and, and if so, 
is, is there some different promise in terms of practicing mindfulness and our capacity to sort of maintain our focus on what, what's most important? Mm-hmm. Um, I think I think we have been ignoring what I call that that more social side, and not purposefully, just by historical accident. The psychologists who first started studying meditation tended to be neuroscientists, yeah. and so they were interested in what does it do for white versus gray matter or executive function of memory. But we've been working on exactly this question. Um, you know, meditation. I mean, I mean, the Buddha pro- apocryphally said, you know, uh, I, I teach one thing and one thing only, and that is the end of suffering. And if you talk to the monks, what they'll say is the purpose of meditation is to increase ethical behavior and compassion. So we've run three studies now where we show that after several weeks of meditation practice, and this is mindfulness meditation, not mm-hmm. even compassion meditation, people become more sensitive to the suffering of others. So in, in our world, that means they're more likely to get up and, and when we, we put an actor in front of them who's in pain or discomfort to see if they can help that person. Mm-hmm. They're also uh, less likely to aggress towards someone who's, who's specifically trying to provoke them. Um, and so I, I firmly believe that, that the science is catching up with the, the kind of wisdom tradition in that a mindfulness practice really is altering um, our compassionate behavior and our ethical behavior. And it does all those other wonderful things too. It's good for your blood pressure and it'll increase your creativity, sure. but that's not the main purpose. So I'm glad we're seeing some work that is focused on its original purpose. Mm-hmm. And uh, do you want to speak to, to the extent to which building a skill or practicing mindfulness has an impact on one's ability to maintain their focus on, on, a, on, on what's important. What comes to mind for me is the wildly provocative and, well, not necessarily provocative, but pioneering study that Cliff Sarin has spearheaded where he has built basically a laboratory in the basement of a retreat center mm-hmm. and brought people uh, who, to to be mindful for three months uh, to to participate Mm -hmm. in a very extensive, very comprehensive mindfulness intervention uh, and compared those who are in the midst of it or who have finished it to people who also volunteered but had to be on a wait list and essentially has shown that when people do this mindfulness, they are better able to detect the sensory uh, stimuli such as a you know, very, very tiny difference in the length of a line from one sort of stimulus to the next. Those who are in the mindfulness actually have this better sort of attentional capacity to focus on the properties of a sensory stimulus. Mm -hmm. And um, I I think that there's other research to that effect that that one's vulnerability to being distracted by information that is not useful or important to the task at hand is enhanced through mindfulness practice, mm-hmm. whether that be, again, some kind of sensory or cognitive task, or whether that be your capacity to recover from a stressor. And research from Emory University's team looking at compassion, called com- uh, cognitively-based compassion training has shown that when people engage in that kind of mindfulness, indeed, they are able to recover more elegantly and gracefully from a social stressor. So again, anything you would add about how mindfulness practice actually improves our capacity to focus on what we intend to be focused on? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I know Cliff's work and I, and I, and I like it. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of mechanisms by which mindfulness works. And I think a lot of the kind of breaking down of the kind of automatic lenses and categorizations that we kind of put over our daily experience are going to come that way. Our side, what I'm interested in though, is more of the <clears throat> This basically the, the compassion side of it. And there, um, we're more interested in, in scalability. So I think what Cliff is doing is, is, is amazing work and kind of getting real granular experiences for us is how do we bring this to the masses, compassion? Mm-hmm. And so we've been partnering with Headspace, uh, which is an app to, for mindfulness. And the reason we chose them is because Andy, the guy who designs it, had many years of monastic training. Mm-hmm. And we've been able to show that the effects we get for increased compassion, you know, sitting several weeks with a, with an ordained lama, are slightly smaller but still very similar using headspace in the real world. And so um, I think the tendency to enhance compassion and empathy toward others comes very rapidly. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it will continue to grow uh, as one practices this and becomes more expert at it over time. Mm -hmm. Um, But as for the mechanisms of whether those mechanisms are involved in focus or involved because I'm seeing you as more similar to me or breaking down automatic racial categorizations or gender barriers, we just don't know, but I'm sure there's going to be multiple mechanisms by which mindfulness is going to exert a lot of important, pro, uh, uh, very useful findings. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
This is a question that we get pretty much every time I run a live Q&A. Um, it came over for me and Sonia Lubomirsky. It's come over to me and Dacker. It came over to me and Iris Moss, to me and uh, Bob Emmons. People are very, very interested in introversion and extroversion. And in particular, whether being an introverted person sort of makes you more vulnerable to uh, or, or makes... To, to being less happy or to uh, having a more difficult time engaging in sort of emotional experiences that are, are grateful or that involve compassion and perhaps altruistic behavior. Is there, is there kind of a, a special challenge that introverts face in pursuing happiness? So I don't work as much on introversion, so I, I can't cite chapter and verse of research, but I'll tell you what I think. Um, and what I think is probably not. Um, I think it's the case that we're all satisfied with different amounts of social contact and different yeah. amounts of relationships. And I know friends who are very extroverted, but if you kind of average the level of, of depth to each of those relationships, they might not be as much as some of the introverts have with a smaller number of people. Yeah. So I think what matters is that each person has a level of social contact and depth to that social contact that he or she feels comfortable with. Um, you know, in large mass studies, might there be a little benefit for extroversions over, over introverts? Potentially. Yeah. But um, I would be surprised if it were a very strong relationship. Yeah, yeah. So what we find from our data, actually from students in this course, is that people who score higher on introversion are less, um, in, in less uh, robust numbers, actually engage or report engaging in the kinds of happiness practices than the extroverts. Mm -hmm. um, it, it just might feel more challenging for them. But... Sure the impact that they report when they do engage of them in, in the practices is, is, is higher, is greater. So, sure. so while it might come easier to the extrovert to yeah. perhaps go out and do um, random acts of kindness, right, to, to engage with a person whom they don't know, um, when introverts sort of decide, I'm just going to try it, and, and it doesn't, like you alluded to, it doesn't mean you have to engage with a stranger or someone who you don't have any reason to trust. Maybe it means, you know, ratcheting up your tendency towards kindness towards the people that you already have deep mm -hmm. and meaningful relationships with. Mm -hmm. Trust me, it's appreciated and it builds your sense of, of strength and depth in the relationship. So that's what we find, that introverts actually benefit more from the exercises and the practices. And, and that the question ultimately is a, is, is a quality versus quantity question. Many I think people that's walk right, away yeah. thinking, oh my God, I have to have 700 really good friends. And um, it, it's not true, right? We're, we're probably not even <laughs> biologically capable of maintaining meaningful connections no with 700 and different people. So. Exactly. And, and, and the fewer you have, oftentimes what that means, not always, but oftentimes what that means is the deeper and more rewarding they might be. And even yeah. the people who have lots of contacts, I would hazard to guess that it's some smaller subset of them that, that they feel most you know, in touch with. So That's, a, that's exactly right. I mean, I, I think that there is a benefit in, for introverts and in perhaps practices, and it may be that mindfulness is a better fit, practices that might lower their sense of vigilance to threat mm -hmm. that might be extended to people whom they don't know. But that seems like a, a much more internal practice that, that could serve their happiness levels. And again, this is a little bit of me, uh, you know, waxing poetic about anecdotal observation and not drawn from an empirical science. Mm -hmm. um, we, we did in the course actually just finish uh, sort of the last week of material and, and it ended with a discussion of, of fit. So how is it that certain people come into this enterprise with particular lived experiences, particular sort of biological affordances, mm -hmm. cultural nuances, and, and how do those contribute to which of the many practices that we, we, we have, have shown in research studies can be impactful are going to offer the most promise to each you know, and I And I think that's where a lot of the important work is going to be done. So I have a student, Dan Lim, who studies the effect that, that life adversity has on people's you know, empathy, compassion, and well-being. And what he finds is that people have had more, because you could say, does adversity harden your heart, right? Or does it warm it. And what we find is that there's a general tendency for people who have faced adversity in their life to have more empathy and more compassion for other people. Mm -hmm. But there's a good amount of heterogeneity in there, right? Mm -hmm. So some people don't, 
more do than don't. But to the extent that we can begin to understand what are those fit variables and why, I think that's where some of the most interesting science that aimed at increasing well-being is going to come from. Yeah, so, so we're working on it. Um, yeah. The question, again, of, of tailoring a happiness re regime to an individual is, 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 is on the books. We're, we're looking at that, at that opportunity, and much like you might join a gym and have a personal trainer who will ask you many questions about your life history and right. your habits and your diet and your sleep patterns, um, and then come up with a specific routine that they – you know, through their uh, realm of, of knowledge about physiology might say, here's what we're going to do. And, and let's follow this to maximize the impact of your new mm -hmm. fitness routine. Some, at some point, uh, that, that would be something that we hope happiness researchers would be able to offer. Um, I, I did notice in looking at the discussion forums that a couple of people said, you know, they, they actually do in the course a fit, a fit test drawn from so Sonia Lubomirsky and Kristen Lyuses published research on on, on how to establish happiness fit. And, and some people said, you know, the practices that I scored highest for fit on truly were the ones that I liked and that, and that came easy to me. And the ones that I scored low on fit on feel like the ones that maybe I should be doing to really <laughs> change how, how, I do, how I am in the world. And, and I've always thought that was a very interesting uh, and provocative uh, sure. observation that maybe it's the ones that we that, that, that don't feel like they're great that, that might be the ones that have a powerful impact. That said, it, it, it doesn't always help to set a goal to do something that feels really, really challenging. And it may yeah. be a, a sequence. We start with the ones that are right. natural. And then, you know, as, it, as, as the course of, of practice continues, we, we can sort of gear into the, those practices that, that feel more challenging but may offer more promise. Mm -hmm. um, so we're getting a few more questions uh, in, in real time. And... One of them is this kind of nature nurture question, and 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 it's, it's pertaining to the the happiness set point. This this theory that actually people come into the world with a particular level of happiness, and and while you might win the lottery, or you might marry your you know dream spouse, or you know be successful in in having the family that you always dreamed of, and it might sort of boost your happiness up for a period. Uh, look at look look a few months or years out and your happiness is back to that particular level. And the question is, and, and, and I, I know that there's controversy about whether mm -hmm. that is a meaningful or a constructive way to think about happiness, but above and beyond, imagining that there is some kind of general range of easy to uh, arrive at happiness for an individual, um, is that set point primarily a genetic kind of uh, sort of uh, experience or or does early lived experience have, have something to do with, with that kind of range of, of yeah. possibility? What, what do you think you, about that? Yeah, as you said, it's, it's a pretty contentious point. Um, yeah. My take on the, on the literature and thinking about emotion, emotional experience more widely is that there may be some resting point, kind of chronic resting point for people, but the latitude around that is going to be large. Yeah. And the reason I say that is because even in the inductions that we do in our lab, um, we can push people's emotions around dramatically. We've seen things like mindfulness practice push people's emotions around dramatically. There's lots of work suggesting that, you know, how what we feel is largely, whether it's appraisal theory or a constructivist theory, what we feel is largely dictated by what we see in the world. And what we see in the world is not always veridical. We have some ability to kind of shape that. Yeah. And so I, I think happiness is a skill, and I, and I know Richard Davidson talks about it in, in this way and well-being about this way. I think there's lots we can do. Might we be starting from different chronic points based on genetics or past experience? Sure. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that really limits us. And I think there's lots of, of techniques and skills out there that people can adopt. I'm sure many of which you've talked about here that yeah. can move it around. So if anybody's out there is worrying that they feel like they have a low set point, I would encourage you not to worry about that. And to, and to when you start embracing these practices, I think you'll see change more than you, you would normally expect. The hard part, right, is to keep working at it, right? When we yeah. start feeling good, all of a sudden, like we go back to our normal ways and then things can change. And so just like exercise, you've got to keep doing, keep doing yeah. the practice. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, oftentimes in our fast paced, busy lives, we're hoping for the one shot fix that will, yeah. that will work and last and, and uh, regrettably, 
as you <laughs> as you described, learning any new skill or ability uh, takes time, and happiness is amongst the ones that that takes longer. And and actually, um, th there isn't a point at which it seems you've done enough. I'm done. I'm as happy as I want to be, and that's it. I don't have to work. <laughs> well, the important, the important thing too, and I, I saw it. I can't remember when. A couple of weeks back, there's a great article, you know, in the New York Times that, that a lot of people start worrying about maximizing their happiness. And if you're always trying to get more and more and more, then you're never going to be happy either. So it's yeah. it's, it's important to be able to feel comfortable at, at you know, moderate yeah. levels too, and not assume something's wrong in your life. I mean, we're going to feel unhappy at times. And if you if we categorize it as something's wrong with me, I think that's another problem too. Yeah, yeah. You know, we want to minimize those, but it's just part of life. Yeah, no, absolutely. And Dakar and I spend a, a fair amount of time trying to uh, uh, sort of support the suggestion that our negative emotional experiences like sadness and, and anger even are really important to the overall happiness that we experience in life. They're adaptive, they're, they're adequate and key responses to certain kinds of circumstances. And then our first Q&A, this session of the course was with Iris Moss, who is mm -hmm. one of the thinkers who really pioneered the idea that you know, striving, striving for happiness or maximizing this idea that I expect myself to be happy based on what I'm doing can really get in the way of actually achieving the goal that you're, that you're trying to achieve. It's this funny thing that um, mirrors a, a statement that some of the wisdom traditions makes about uh, enlightenment, right? If you ever meet a guru or a, a, a monastic who says, I'm enlightened, you know for sure they're not. So the same thing goes for happiness, right? I'm, I'm the happiest that I, that I could possibly be. Um, you know, for sure, that's not, that's not really same, true. Coming from the Buddhist tradition, same thing goes for compassion, right? Sometimes compassion means not giving in to somebody to make them feel good in the moment, but helping them work through something that's difficult because in the long term, it will be better for them. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, thanks for that. I have a couple of questions that were submitted earlier this week sure. um, that we'll spend, we don't have that much time left, so um, we'll, 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 we'll do what we can. But they're basically bigger human questions. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe our my research certainly doesn't speak to them, and, and maybe yours will or won't, but I think sometimes students or people out in the world really just want to hear our perspective on it. And sure. Two questions are kind of like but I'm gonna I'm gonna offer them together rather than and ask them separately because they're so related and it's 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 about human behavior in the world and and why sometimes humans act in such immoral or hateful or hostile ways and why people aren't just always nice why is why why hasn't evolution sculpted us to be better at this pro-social thing? Sure, so it's a good question um, and. There's a long and a short answer, right? The short answer, and I'll give you the long answer, is that uh, evolution didn't shape the mind to be a saint. It shaped it to be adaptive. And sometimes there can, immoral behavior can be highly adaptive. And so I like to think about things in terms of, you know, what's good for me in the moment versus what's good for me in the long run. And usually what's good for me in the long run is behaving in a, in a moral way. Um, but you're saying, why, why don't we evolve to be all good because I said, well, over time, people who cooperate, who have empathy are the ones who do well in evolutionary models, and that's true. But imagine if we had a situation where everybody was moral and everybody was trustworthy. Yeah. If there were a genetic mutation that made somebody untrustworthy, that person would clean up. Everybody would, <laughs> would give them all their resources and they yeah. wouldn't have to worry about it. And that person would thrive and they would have better, re I mean, an evolutionary biological sense would have better reproductive success until over time, the defectors and the cheaters dominated the world. But then the few people who then would start cooperating would begin to build resources. And so as a lot of people have shown, you know, Martin Novak, Bob Frank, mm -hmm. Ethical behavior is always going to be in an equilibrium. You're never going to have a society where everybody is completely moral or everybody is completely immoral just because there's too many resources to be gained. Um, and so our goal, I think, as a society is to nudge up that set point as high as we can for pro-social and ethical behavior. But just from an adaptive sense, you know, your mind will convince you. Some, and we do this in our lab. You know, 90% of people in our lab will cheat on something minor that puts somebody else in a small predicament if they believe they have anonymity because there's no long-term consequence. And they'll rationalize it. They'll say, oh, I didn't really do something bad. Here's why I did it. Um, and so I think you know that's part of us. Um, but we have to think about ultimately the best gains for us as individuals and as a society come from long-term cooperation and treating each other with respect and empathy and kindness. 
but it doesn't mean that it's ever going to be a situation where everybody's always doing that because that would be unsustainable. Yeah. So in the same way that we, we have to deal with the reality that our own personal quest or journey or prioritization of our lived experiences uh, towards trying to uh, realize a greater happiness, um, it takes time and, and continued effort at a broader societal level. Um, there's, there's the same challenge. This isn't something that, again, there's going to be one clear solution for. And I love that you brought up the, the idea or the, the, the challenge to imagine a world where, where everybody was mm -hmm. kind and moral all the time. And, and then the notion that, 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 that a genetic um, kind of a adaptation or, or variance might lead to the, 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 an alternate right. person who would, who, who would be more self-interested right. self and, and how without the sort of greater representation of self-interest across the, the species, uh, that, that would lead to a much bigger problem than what we're facing now, which is you know, trying to sort of figure out a way to manage it and perhaps preventive, preventatively at, at societal levels yeah. provide the kinds of access to resources that, right. that people need in order to really flourish and cultivate their sense of pride and, and for, passion yeah. and, and, and gratitude. Me, one of the ways to do this at a societal level is what we're not doing, and that is teaching kids early on to kind of cultivate these emotions because the one thing we know when you cultivate gratitude or authentic sense of pride or, or, or compassion is it makes you more willing to be moral in all kinds of domains without having to think about it, right? It just changes your, it makes you value the future more, more which makes you want to behave more honestly, behave more kind, sacrifice for yourself. And so rather than kind of just putting out norms like you should do this, I think if we actually, you know, teach people to cultivate these emotions as part of their lives, it will benefit their ethical behavior and by so doing their own individual success and society's success at large because we'll have stronger you know, social networks. Yeah, and it sounds like you've got good evidence that, that those kind of emotional orientations are more effective than the top-down, uh, rational, yeah, exactly. executive uh, uh, forces that might- Right, because might... We're, not, we're not trying to fight a bad impulse to want something better in the moment. We're actually making ourselves value the future more. And so then it becomes easier to pursue it. So it's kind of an, an easier, more more robust mechanism you know, than, a, than a competitive one. Yeah, sort of really trying to get at the problem and address the issue at a lower level rather than stick a Band-Aid over the top and right. say, let's hope this Band-Aid holds when, right. when we're right. going for a swim in the pool. Yeah. So, um, well, we're at 9.59. Uh, Dave, is there any sort of parting wisdom or advice or thoughts you want to share with our audience before we conclude? Um, no parting advice. I, was, I just want to commend you for being part of this course. I think Emiliana is interviewing lots of experts, distilling lots of information to you on, on the science of happiness in a better way than I think any individual of us can do it. And so hopefully you'll take stuff from this course and make it part of your life. And I thank you for doing a service for that, because I think if there were more of these issues, I think hopefully we have happier people in the world. Well, I'm so honored and it's a privilege for me to be this the kind of messenger. And I want to uh, offer my gratitude for the work that you do, Dave, because I, again, get to draw from all these wonderful studies and publications that, that people who like you are doing and explain them out in the world in this course. And, and it's such a treasure for the audience to actually get to hear from you instead of translated through me. And um, thank you so much for making the time sure. to do this Q&A and to share your thoughts and, and empirical expertise with, with, this, with this community. Sure, happy, happy. And um, have a wonderful remainder of your day. And thank you for joining the Q&A, all the people out in the world. And um, to you also, have a wonderful day. It's Emiliana signing off. <laughs>